Um, so thank you for, for coming out to, to the meeting and listening to what, what I have to say. Um, so I initially wrote this talk for um, an academic conference and it was intended as kind of a retrospective on the research that's been taking place here for the past 50 years. Um, and you know, I kind of injected my own research into it, um, but it was really more of a broader context discussing the landscape and what we know about the landscape outside of, of the village, outside of the National Register District here. So giving this a second time today, I'm gonna you know, hone in a little bit more on my own personal research um, and hopefully get some questions and some generate some discussion uh, so that you know we can we can develop that story a little bit better. So charcoal production at Catoctin Furnace in the in the adjacent mountain range here resulted in the first uh, large scale alteration of the landscape by European immigrants and enslaved Africans, encapsulating many of the conditions and forces that were critical to the formation of the early American experience. So 50 years after the first archeology span of Catoctin Furnace, we have this unprecedented amount of data that we didn't have before. Um, and and a, a lot of it has come, you know, just within the past 20, year, 20 or 30 years. So it's time to kind of reflect on that. Um, there we go. So I don't need to go over, you know, as I did at the conference, um, you know, the history of Catoctin Furnace, but just as, as kind of a refresher, uh, until 1873, the furnace stacks ran exclusively on charcoal. But even after 1873, when they installed the Coke furnace, uh, they continued to use charcoal. So they were, they were pulling charcoal from the hills until the furnace uh, closed. Um, in the 1950s, uh, they established old, the park, um, sorry, the state and the, the, the federal government actually bought up a lot of the property around here. Um, and then 1950s, a state park was established and then further to the north, Catoctin Mountain National Park. And that, uh, you know, the, the, the purchase of all this land um, kind of inhibited development and um, it created a landscape that was ripe for research and interpretation with a, a common land use history. So the most important um, economic resources at Catoctin Furnace were, um, you know, wood lumber that could be converted to charcoal, uh, iron ore, uh, limestone flux, and water. And while you know the three of those resources were highly localized, um, they had to pull charcoal out of almost 11,000 acres at one point of mountain property, um, moving from place to place, clear cutting the area and burning um, in charcoal. Um, hearths, which I actually is one right there. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, there's a model right there. Michelle, so, for those of you who may not be familiar, not to interrupt the, the talk, but for those of you who may not, why is this? I can bring the laptop over. Okay. There's a wonderful charcoal model okay. made by the National Park Service. And you can see there's an African American gentleman as a collier, which would be correct. Um, and you can see it's beautifully um, made and the park, Catoctin Mountain Park allowed us to buy one when they had one made for their new exhibit, which was meant that we benefited. So yeah, that's a charcoal heart. Yeah, and, and a note a little bit about terminology just because you know I, I've been calling them Collier's Pits, it might slip out today, um, but Collier, um, and, and there, there might, it might appear on these older maps as well, because I've recycled all of these maps over the, the period, but a uh, Collier can refer to someone who actually is, is mining coal as well, and um, they are not pits. They look like pits on LIDAR, and that's initially why, you know, maybe it got wired in my head, <laughs> um, but they are actually three-dimensional objects. There's a pit in the middle, um, so I've, I've been trying to call them charcoal hearths now. So, the furnace required at least 4,500 cords of wood to be converted into charcoal uh, a year. And I wanted to the kind of point that a, a, a cord of wood is an outdated term. Um, it, it is 128 cubic feet of wood. Uh, it's about the size of two um, eight foot truck beds for comparison. So that's the basic kind of unit of that they use to measure wood for uh, wage purposes and also to measure the, the output of the furnace and say, you know, um, for, for charcoal as well. 
Um, so often forgotten against this backdrop is that there are other uses of wood in the village that we have documented archeologically. Um, there's a constant supply of firewood coming in that was needed for cooking and heating the houses from the Iron Master's mansion all the way to the humble um, enslaved quarters. Uh, there were also secondary industries um, that developed in the region, tanneries and, and sawmills, um, besides you know, private sawmills, um, as opposed to the, the company one. Um, and yeah, the, I've kind of highlighted the uh, Catoctin furnace there. And you can see underneath that, that red line is the, the grist mill and the, the sawmill for, that belong to the furnace. So in a paper, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. In a paper I presented in 2016, um, at that time, uh, I, I presented it with a colleague of mine who, who doesn't work in the same office anymore, but he, he and I kind of went through and researched um, charcoal hearths. We, we obtained LIDAR imagery, which had just been, become available to us at, in, in the state of Maryland. So it was something new and cool. Um, so we toyed around with that, but because of the time constraints, we were only able to look at 5,000 acres at the time. So in that 5,000 acres, um, we were able to identify these small circular um, kind of projections that are, they're, they're rimmed by um, areas that are, uh, they're, they're rimmed by earth or stones um, and they show up very, very well, um, you know, on a on three-dimensional hillshade imagery um, that's been generated from a LIDAR drive uh, surface model on, in GIS. And you can also see the, the charcoal roads that are running along there as well. So we mapped in 721 of these things over about 5,000 acres. Um, and given that we knew that the Catoctin Furnace owned about 11,000 acres, um, we, we extrapolated that number and pr projected that there were probably around 15, uh, around 1500 pits um, that would be present across that 11,000 acres. Um, and I argued at the time also that they were based on other furnaces and literature of the time that they were allowing the woodland to regenerate in 30 year cycles. They would clear cut an area, allow it to regenerate and then come back in 30 years. Um, and they would, you know, seed it with um, wood that they wanted to use for charcoal. So it changed the composition of the forest. Okay, so uh, so that that is sorry that that is the uh, the mapping that, that we completed it in 2016 and the roads as well. So this will all be recorded so you can see that it's really hard to, to kind of make those those dots out. So I have now completed um, over many months mapping in all the charcoal hearts that I could find on lidar imagery. Um, in the vicinity, and it's it's generated some really interesting results. So the final number that we that I had was 1,328 charcoal hearts. Um, they uh, this is definitely an undercount because we've actually spoken with local informants that say you know I have charcoal hearts on my land and they don't show up on the lidar very well. They do, they do if you look really really close. Um, but I'm looking at these when I'm falling asleep after my toddler goes to sleep every night and getting through what I can, and it's all visual. So um, there's no algorithm, so it's done visually. So um, somebody who is more advanced in the coding than I am can probably figure out a better way to do this. Um, but this is the number that we're settled on for now. I'm sure we're off by about a hundred, <laughs> at least, at least. Uh, so 855 of those charcoal hearths, about 64% are found in what we're calling the mountain track. You can see that area in red there. Um, that is, that's kind of a heat map. The red, the reddest parts of that, um, there's 64 um, charcoal hearths per kilometer. The, the lightest um, green, uh, actually the darkest green, sorry, the, the darkest green areas um, are about one per acre. So in between there, there's that, that scale. So most of them show up on the slopes of the hills um, facing Catoctin Furnace and on the mountain track. And that, you know, that, that's telling uh, that area was under Catoctin Furnace ownership for the longest period of time. They actually sold the area that's, that's kind of separated out to the, to the west of that um, early on. So I don't know if it had to do with uh, transporting the charcoal, you know, some kind of distance. It's not, I mean, it's not that much of a distance, um, but maybe there were also 
conditions there that were not good for the type of wood that they wanted as well. But regardless, that's the, they're, they're just sparser on the, the western side of the mountain. Uh, interestingly, 268 charcoal hearths were found outside of the Catoctin Furnace property proper. Um, so that means that local property owners were making a profit, you know, um, for, you know, kind of feeding the insatiable appetite for charcoal at, at, the, at the furnace as well. I also want to call out the, uh, the, 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 the property that is mapped on this map now um, that, that was done um, by, a, a, that was a collaborative effort. I don't know if Michael Brandon's on the, <laughs> the call today, but he and an, an intern that, I, that we worked with mapped out that 11,000 acres. So I just want to give proper credit to them. Okay, so the interesting part about this, uh, so these this industrial wood cutting in that area, it creates drier conditions. It results from the, because the overstory is removed, um, there's large amounts of dry and woody debris left behind, sawdust. Um, so when the winds were strong, people were making charcoal hearths. Um, it, it was the right conditions for natural disasters. So there was a 2018 study um, where they, they drilled into uh, witness trees, older trees in Catoctin Mountain National Park, um, and they found there were burn scars lots of burn scars from 1819 to 1951. And they corroborated some of that with newspaper research. Um, but they did, they only, they did a very cursory analysis of the newspaper research. It was a scientific paper. Uh, so I did a deeper dive into the, the, the forest fires, looking at other newspapers outside of the area. And we were able to come up with 34 instances of forest fires um, from 1826 to 1942. Uh, sometimes two within a matter of, of, of months of each other. Um, so in the 19th century, most of these took place in the spring and fall. Um, they were due to incendiaries, fire bugs, um, or to charcoal pits, uh, uh, charcoal hearts that got out of control. Uh, by 1903, uh, Catoctin Furnace was essentially closed. Um, but the forest fires continued uh, because, um, and we know <laughs> from local informants as well as from newspaper articles, that uh, people were um, setting fires, tr attempting controlled burns um, to increase huckleberry yields, um, wild blueberries, um, and uh, they would come back the following year, and they, they would just be prolific, and they would, you know, sell them to, to local markets. And I looked at some price. I didn't get a chance to, to look into um, prices, <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're the same prices as, as your, you know, kind of exotic fruit would look like in the early 20th century. So I don't know, that, that's, an, that's some research that we should probably look into, is looking at huckleberry prices in the local, <laughs> local stores. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, a description of the forest fire in 1915 also shows that there were um, a lot more pine trees on the tops of the hills, which are not so common. Um, when you take a hike through the woods, you, you'll see a few stands, um, but they were evidently a lot more common. And you know, there's there's descriptions of them burning. This one says, from this place, the two fires made a very spectacular appearance on the top of the hill are many pine trees and the flames would envelope these and shoot many feet skyward. So lots of forest fires taking place um, even after the, the, the furnace closes. And these fires generally affected Catoctin Furnace more than they affected the local property owners. Um, there was some property damage and the newspapers were good to report that. Um, in 1871, a house was destroyed with some outbuildings. A 1902 fire destroyed a schoolhouse. Um, but in contrast, the figure of, of $12,000 in material and labor at Catoctin Furnace, because they would send people up there, they'd have to drop what they're doing and go up there and fight the fire, put dirt and you know, water down and all kinds of stuff. So in amount of, they, they would factor that loss of labor, as well as the loss of charcoal um, and, and, and timber for other purposes, building purposes. Um, so that that is important because, um, you know, Smaller contained fires probably didn't show up in the papers so often. They only did it when there was a massive amount of, of, of property damage. 
So the effects of these forest fires and the sudden end of these occurrences um, because of state and federal intervention in the 1950s um, really changed the, the, the landscape here, the, the ecology, the forest ecology. So because of all those forest fires taking place, and we were not exactly sure what took place before European settlers were here as well, um, but the frequent forest fires in the spring and fall are happening. There's portions that are clear cut um, for charcoal production and are allowed to regenerate, and the conditions favor uh, oak and chestnut at the expense of fire sensitive hard, uh, hardwoods and woody shrubs and hemlock. Um, so from 1903, when the furnace closes to the 1950s, charcoal production ceases, but the forest fires continue. Uh, there's an increase in woody shrubs and quick growing trees and chestnut and oak continue to dominate, but there's that chestnut blight in the 1920s. So white oak becomes the most common species. Um, and then finally, uh, the, this develop, the, the white oak um, forms that overstory, but currently there's more fire sensitive species that are growing um, prolifically, uh, especially in, in Kadokan Mountain National Park, there's this giant understory of, of black gum. So we learned a lot more about the consumption of wood within the village uh, for purposes other than charcoal um, when we did the excavations at the Forgeman's house. Um, this was in 2016, a lot of stuff happened in 2016. So there we are doing the uh, the, this mitigation work underneath the floorboards where we found approximately 30,000 artifacts. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it's been many years and we're still not complete um, with the analysis, but it is, it's a massive amount of work. So yeah, we need an intern or a master student that's interested in looking at the, doing a, a more um, detailed analysis of the artifacts. So most of the artifacts um, came from the South uh, sorry, yeah, the, the south uh, western portion of, of the house, uh, but there was an exceptionally well-preserved area um, here in front of the fireplace, and um, so we took some samples uh, and, and sent them for um, flotation analysis so that the, um, we could determine what types of organic materials uh, were there. And, you know, among a lot of other things like coffee beans and tea leaves and things like that, we got some really nice wood samples. Flotation uh, is water screen, Yes, water screen. For those of you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, yeah, the, the, the lighter stuff comes to the top and then somebody who knows what they're looking at uh, looks at it through a microscope and is able to, to make positive identifications. Uh, burnt wood taxa, charcoal wood, which included, uh, which indicates firewood. Uh, this included American beech, American chestnut, hickory, and white oak. And then we got some samples of uncharred wood, um, which was pine with some residual paint. So obviously building material here. So this indicated use in, in building. Um, beech and black walnut shells indicate that the trees also provided uh, nutrition for the furnace workers. And it should be noted that beech and uh, black walnut showed little to no association with the, um, the, uh, the, the areas that were used for charcoaling in the mountains. So a different area was exploited, um, probably closer to, to the village during the active furnace years. Uh, so in 2016, we also, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. okay. So that possibly could have come from the other side of the mountain as well, where the conditions are a bit wetter um, and moister. Or along the river, yes, exactly. So in 2016, we also did dendrochronology um, with Oxford Tree Ring Laboratory. Uh, they were able to identify not only the dates of some of the buildings here, uh, but also identify the woods uh, that were used in construction. So um, we determined that white oak, chestnut oak, and chestnut, American chestnut, were used in the worker housing. We have documented <laughs> examples of this. Um, along with our pine from, from the Forgeman's house. Um, white oak, notably white oak and chestnut were also used in the coffins at the African-American cemetery. So most of the building used for lumber, a lot of the building and materials used for lumber um, were likely recovered from the Eastern mountain slopes in the same area that the, you know, the charcoaling was taking place. So I also wanted to note that the, this is a new slide, so I did this last night, 
the lidar shows uh, you know the 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 sawmills um, were located along near to charcoal roads. Obviously, I'm not sure 100 percent sure which one came first. Um, whether you know this was a a road to get down you know to access the mountain, um, which became a charcoal road and you know became a, a a main avenue to the sawmills. But it is it is worth noting that. Um, that sawmills and tanneries, you know, and, and the other industries that use wood and bark and lumber materials, um, you know, were, it was all interrelated um, using those networks of roads to get lumber down the mountains. In the first half of the 19th century, um, we talked that Catoctin Furnace, as you know, relied very heavily on, on slave labor and slave labor. There were um, instances of black colliers, teamsters, and woodcutters. We know of um, in Baker Johnson's last will and testament, which enumerated 80 slaves of his, uh, he indicated an individual named Collier Sam and another named Wagoner Henry and another named Harvey the Wagoner. Um, so this was not uncommon. There's enslaved people that are documented being fulfilling the same tasks um, and same jobs at Hopewell Furnace and Cornwall Furnace. Um, there's only a few named references. Um, this is a photograph from a guy named Joseph Johns that was taken in 1906, shortly before his death. And he was supposedly an enslaved, uh, he escaped um, his, uh, shortly before the Civil War, uh, moved to Lebanon County, Pennsylvania, and just charcoal, worked as a collier the rest of his years. Um, so he didn't just you know, know how to do that. He, he was clearly trained. So we're not exactly sure that the records are not very clear of where he came from, but it is an interesting story. Um, and he's, he's kind of local folklore there. Um, and of course, enslaved individuals were gradually replaced with wage labor prior to the Civil War. So the wages, we know a lot about the wage labor um, because of uh, our um, ledgers, our store ledgers, and also from the Upper Mine Bank ledger as well. Um, so these, these date to 1863, 64, 82, 86, and 1900. Um, and we have the entire year um, from the Upper Mine ledger. Um, so interesting here is that there's not that much variation with, with the cost of, of a cut of wood. You, you know, they don't tend to increase or decrease over a very long span of time. Um, and I've put the daily wages for bank um, or bank work and furnace, furnace work here as well, just as, as a comparison. So 50 cents for cutting a cord of wood in 1864, $1.20 for a day of work at um, the ore bank. Um, also notable is that the, the, there's different rates for different wood, even in the same day. Um, I put an example down there. Um, again, there's no way that you'll be able to read it, but um, there's on the same day, there's 40 cents per cord and 50, uh, 30, uh, sorry, 40 cents per cord and 50 cents per cord. And there's also cross ties that are cut as well for a different rate. So as far as the quantities, um, they're the, obviously the people are purchasing the most wood in the winter time when you need it for, for heating your house. Um, the volume, uh, the vol I should note that the, 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 the wood was sold back <laughs> to the people that, that probably cut it. Um, at nearly double to triple the cost of, of procuring it. So cords of wood were, were likely used for buildings, you know, not just for firewood, for, for buildings and for fence rails, repairs to private properties and worker houses. Um, in many cases, um, the rent is charged to individuals who are buying the firewood as well. So they're probably fixing their own houses with wood that they're buying from the store. Um, hopefully they didn't have to pay too much for it. Um, I note also that in the store ledgers, nobody ever buys nails. <laughs> so I guess that was like a perk of living here. There's no, there's no sales of nails in all those years in the store ledgers. Um, also no furniture, no toys, um, things like that. So I think all those things were made here. Um, also interesting, not a, not a single mention of charcoal production, um, charcoal rates. Nobody's buying charcoal. Um, so, or in 
it, they don't appear in the store ledgers as well. So, uh, sorry, the, the the wages, the upper mine bank. So we don't know how much they were paying colliers to procure their, their charcoal. But I did find an 1883 article of somebody, a Mr. Petticord, um, that moved um, to Texas. And he um, he's supposed to burn about 5,000 bushels of charcoal <laughs> this season. So that gives you an idea of how much they, they were um you know, how much it was possible to, to burn. I, I think that's kind of an exaggeration, but um, I don't know, it's, it's possible. So we turn to other um, sources to look for collier wages. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail here. This was a, a, there's an extra comma there, sorry. It should be William Ellicott and Son, Baltimore. This was a furnace that we have data for that was located to the south of the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. And we have very extensive rates for colliers that were working there. They had to haul charcoal approximately uh, 15 miles from the south into the city. So obviously the rates are going to be a bit higher, but there is a definite disparity. Um, this, this red arrow shows you exactly how much somebody working the entire day mining would earn. And yet this, this, you know, the colliers are almost consistently above that, except in the 1860s, working in Baltimore, sometimes um, twice that much almost. We know that colliers did earn quite a bit of money. Um, so I, I found this example. <laughs> um, you know, this is not this, I'm gonna read this in a second, but I found two other articles that, that, um, that were similar to this in which a collier had passed <laughs> away and left a small fortune. Um, so this is, uh, it says two alleged widows, Camden, New Jersey, March 5th. Two women now claim the estate left by Charles Fidel, a, char a charcoal burner who left a will bequeathing his estate, which amounts to $20,000 as the will expressed it, my wife. No name was given. One of the claimants whose past history is unknown here has five children and the other who lived with him at the time of his death has two children. <laughs> so, um, this was not uncommon uh, for them to leave a small fortune when they passed away. They lived very secluded lives. It wasn't; it was more suitable for single men. They didn't have a lot of excesses because they were, you know, going down to the village regularly, you know, to drink the money away or something. So um, we don't know a lot about the charcoal uh, producers here, but we do know that they they probably were were okay. They they made out. Um, it was a tough life, but financially they, they might have made out okay. So in conclusion, we know a lot about the historic industrial landscape now at Catoctin Furnace that we, we didn't know before um, about the scale and expanse of charcoal production, the impacts on forest ecology, um, the, uh, the economic implications of wood consumption in the village, um, and these uh, these ecological and economic impacts that were provided by the, again, the insatiable appetite for charcoal at Catoctin Furnace, um, weave a narrative that kind of decentralizes that, that red area on the map there, the, um, the National Register District in favor of, of the broader landscape. Um, so um, that is all I have. And I'm happy to field any questions or comments. So.